Okay, so that's that's um, what the issue is then. Okay. Totally. Now we know. Now we know. It's uh it's still loading, so if we can just hang tight for one more second. Stephen's creating a backdrop, it looks like. <laughs> yeah, Zeiss something or other. I don't know what to put on there. Uh, this will work. So Ken, I told Stephen I told Stephen the same thing that we'll make it more interactive and let him, you know, you guys can interrupt me whenever. You can check out the Q&A and Stephen will just ask me technical questions. Yeah, perfect. That sounds like a good plan. Did you want to get started or wait for Stephen to turn? We're, we're fine. I, I can set this as a background. I think we're good. We can go ahead and get okay. started. I'm going to hit start. Excellent. All right, we are live. Excellent. Nice. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> nice. Is it backwards well, for you? No, it's forwards for us. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, everybody. Welcome in. Come on in. Uh, we're going to get started in just a few minutes with our session. Welcome, welcome. Good afternoon for those of you in the United States, aside from Alaska and Hawaii. It's still good morning over there. But uh, around the world, we don't even know where everyone's coming in from. So they'll have to let us know. So let us know in the chat where you're all from. We'd love to, to hear where you're joining us from. First of all, I'd like to introduce uh, Toronto. <laughs> Hi, go Ollie. Uh, I want to introduce everybody on the team that's going to be uh, with us in this uh, presentation. Kat Del Rosario, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Yes. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining today. I'm Kat Del Rosario. I'm the Cinema Market Marketing Specialist here in LA. Uh, Snehal, Stephen, and myself work out of the showroom. Um, we do demos and host a lot of events. Uh, you know, in a pre-COVID world, we were doing a lot of in-person events and um, sponsor festivals, etc. So I'm your contact if you have any stories of, um, you know, of productions that have used size lenses, or if you yourself have used size lenses, then you can definitely reach out to me. I'll put my email in the chat. I'm Stephen Balsley. Um, I'm basically the technical cinema sales specialist for the team. If you have questions about demos or just lenses in general, let me know. But I help run the uh, showroom in Los Angeles in Sherman Oaks. Uh, once that's open again, we'd love to have you back in. So definitely take my email down and uh, let me know if you're interested in coming by and we can get you set up. And I'd like to thank everyone, all our participants for coming in today to be a part of this presentation. Okay, so we see Burbank, California, Park City, Utah. Put in the chat where you're from, we'd love to hear it. Um, lighting camera, oh, Wicklow, Ireland. All right, cool, John, nice to have you here. Wow, nice. This is amazing. Um, what we're gonna be talking about and covering today uh, with my colleagues is lens flare characteristics. So we're gonna do a few things in this workshop. We're gonna learn about defining what is a lens flare, how does it occur, you know, and how it, it it's all comes together, how does it happen? And then what we're going to do is show the application of it because we're able to actually take uh, the characteristics and in nowadays with computer technology and advanced kind of manufacturing process, we're able to predict and manipulate and kind of create lens characteristics like that that are favorable. And so then we'll talk and introduce to you the radiance lenses, the Supreme Prime radiance lenses, which sport some of these flare characteristics and stuff like that. And then we'll open it up for a Q&A. Uh, at the end as well, if there's more specific questions. Now, anytime during the presentation, please interrupt us by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom. So you click on the Q&A button at the bottom, put in a question, and as soon as questions come in, and if something good has come in, Kat's gonna actually stop, uh, stop us for a second and let you come in and ask the question or she'll ask on your behalf, whatever you prefer. And Steven, he's uh, uh, technically minded, so he's gonna step in and clarify things and, and ask questions as well in between while we're uh, going on the presentation. So this is a very interactive workshop, more of like a chance for people to really understand the topic and not just uh, for us to present uh, the technology. That's not the only um, uh, thing that we want to do today. We want you to understand exactly what flares are, where they come from, you know, why do people like them? You know, like there's all kinds of different uh, aspects to discuss uh, about this topic. Um, so I think it's going to be a really interesting talk. We're going to have a lot of fun. Uh, no stress and, you know, we're not going to have a quiz at the end, although, you know, hopefully 
what we feel is that by the end of the presentation, you'll have a really deeper understanding of, of some of this, uh, of the topic. So Stephen, did I miss anything? Uh, so far, so good. So far, so good. All right, cool. So we're gonna go ahead and get started with uh, the presentation. And again, click on the Q&A button if you have a question, we'll stop and, uh, and, and answer it for you. So let's go ahead and share this and start it out. All right. So uh, ultimately we're gonna talk about the uh, Zeiss Radiance lens development because this is really the amalgamation of the, the flare characteristics. But we're gonna first start with defining what is a lens flare. And we're gonna uh, do this um, thanks to Dr. Benjamin Volker, who is a, a engineer and expert uh, that works at Zeiss headquarters in Germany and actually helped develop um, the flare characteristics that we see in the radiance lenses. But he is a flare master. He understands uh, how optics uh, cause these kinds of characteristics. He's, he, def he takes a definition and then through computer models is ab actually able to dial out the characteristic if it's undesirable. So in the optics world, of course, we love flares and cinema lenses, but you don't necessarily like flares and things like microscopes or telescopes or binoculars. And so there you're really trying to cut back these characteristics. So if you learn how to cut back the characteristics, you can on the flip side, maybe manipulate it and create characteristics that you like. So that's exactly what this whole project was about. And as part of the project, we had to define what the lens flare was. So what is a lens flare? And this is a very interesting image because obviously there's a lens here <laughs> looking at these astronauts in space and it's the interaction between the light source, the objects, uh, and uh, the glass that is causing the lens flare characteristics that you see. You see all kinds of stuff around the, the light source. You see kind of these beams of light, almost like star patterns. Um, you see uh, kind of barrel shapes, shapes of the barrel or pieces of the glass elements and things like that and different colors reflecting back at you. So let's define what are these flares and where do they come from? So normally, the, a lens is designed optically, not taking into flares into account. It, it, it's meant to be an optical system that's a magnification. Generally, that's what an optical design does is it magnifies. So each time we add a focal length, we're actually magnifying reality and bringing it closer to us, right? So a 21 millimeter brings you know reality from here, but it, maybe a 135 will bring it from there and bring it closer to us. So what happens is that there's always a light path, right? Through a lens, there's always the, the whatever the lens is seeing in front of the lens, uh, whatever the world is, it's actually transmitting that piece of the world through all the optical elements and coming out the backside and then being, you know, ex, uh, exposing the, the sensor at the back of the, the, the camera. Because nowadays, of course, it's mostly a digital sensor, but it, it's the same exact principle of film that you're projecting an image circle um, uh, onto a flat surface, either a plane like a for a digital sensor or for a film sensor. And what you're what you're really intending to do is take reality and and kind of recreate it in this process. But the thing is, is that light doesn't necessarily travel in a nice way through optical objects. That's the issue, right? In, in you know, an ideal world, you would have this picture on the top right uh, without a light source. And so if there's no light source at all, but you could still illuminate the objects, right? You would basically see this kind of photograph where whatever image the lens was seeing, it just transposed it and then projected it onto the film plane and it was captured. But, you know, that's an ideal world. And in reality, neither of these objects made, uh, or any of these three objects, the two astronauts or the earth, could not have been lit by something that didn't exist. Of course, there's a light source uh, that's directing it. So now let's take into account that if we had a light source, because you need a light source to illum illuminate everything, what, what is actually happening over here? Well, if I was outside without any optics, and I was just looking at this scene, this is what I might see. I'll see the sun in the distance. I'll see the uh, illuminated earth and I'll see these astronauts illuminated. But the problem is, is that we don't just look at this with a bare circle, meaning that lens theoretically, a theoretical lens would be just a hole cut out in space. And if you had just a hole cut out in space as your eye, then this is my, maybe what you see, but that's not what we see because we actually have glass in the way between what objects are out there and the point source of light and then the film plane that we're trying to expose onto. And these are interaction between the light source and the glass uh, and the elements and the metal inside the lens and so much other stuff, the plastics and the paint that are causing this flare characteristic. 
So again, one more time, this is reality, is what the sun really looks like. And this is what it looks like with a lens. The issue is for human eye, we're somewhere in between this. We're, we're not exact. We're not here because we don't have this many elements preventing it or this much uh, impurities in the way for our eyes. But we also don't have this because we still have a lens. So yeah, our lens is still doing some stuff. And with a direct light source in our eye, you know that there's reflections and there's things that happen with your eye as well and sensitivities. So, so we're somewhere in between. This is theoretical and this is reality for a lens and the eyes are somewhere in between. So what is happening inside? Well, what is a lens flare caused by? There's multiple things. There's many things. So let's pick one piece at a time. One thing that we could talk about is ghosting. Ghosting is when you have the point source of light itself is going inside the lens and then bouncing around because it's being reflected a little bit off of the glass surfaces. Not maybe if it's a lot of reflection, then you're gonna get a lot of ghosting. And it's gonna really gray out the image. But if you get a little bit of uh, bouncing around, you get a less ghosting, okay? And it doesn't just bounce off of one element, it bounces off of maybe um, multiple elements at a time. So there's many different paths that the light is taking through the lens and it's bouncing around as it goes through the path instead of going through clean. So that's what you see right here is what we call the ghost. This is really the lens elements themselves being reflected. And if you pan this camera around, you'll see the stack of lens elements separate and come back together again. And that is ghosting. So that's the first piece. The second piece is the light that's scattered off of mechanical surfaces, stray light. And this light also bounces around uh, off of plastic surfaces, mechanical surface, metal, uh, different colored paints. So nowadays we try to use really, really deep matte blacks so that we can try to eliminate as much as possible any of the stray light. But there's always something that goes through a lens and, and might bounce around. And that light itself, causes the barrel shape, the shape of the barrel of the lens. So that you're actually seeing the housing, the inner side of the housing of the lens. That is another piece of the lens flare. And we just circled over here. You kind of see like the, the orangish colors with the blue in the middle. The blue in the middle is still a lens element, but the orange is kind of rings around it that you see that almost look like a spider, you know, cocooning something. That's actually the barrel of the lens that you're seeing from the inside. And then there's light scattered off of polished optical surfaces, AKA your digital sensor. Your digital sensor more times than not will have a uh, low pass filter. So Stephen, can you explain to us what a low pass filter is? Yeah, um, usually what will happen with the camera is there's a combination of things that go on. Um, there's a lot of artifacts that still can reach the sensor that the camera doesn't need. Um, one of them is moire. If you've seen shirts with a crisscross pattern, um, the moire is, is an issue for a lot of cameras. So that will be taken into account in the OLPF. There's also um, uh, infrared light, IR pollution in light. If it gets too strong, you see a reddish, pinkish kind of tone. So there's, there's a little bit of that. There's usually an IR filter that will cut off that portion of light. So if light is on a spectrum from left to right, they're basically snipping the ends off to, to give you just the visual part that you want to keep. So the OLPF itself has a mixture. It's a recipe and it's different for every single camera and sensor. It's not just based on a brand or something. Every single sensor is going to have a different OLPF to it. Um, sometimes they'll be similar, but they're always different. And um, that will actually cause artifacts as well because you're stacking the recipe with different things you're cutting and different things you're doing. So the light has to pass through all of that glass and as it does that, you see some reflections. So in, in, in a red camera, for instance, I worked at red for a while, so I know this, there's a little red dots that will appear if you're shining directly at a really, really bright object, you'll see kind of a grid pattern of red dots. Um, in other cameras, you'll see a bluish pattern or purple hues, stuff like that doesn't always come specifically from the lens, it's actually from the, the camera itself. Yeah, just like Steven said, you know, not every piece of the flare characteristic you're seeing is actually coming just from the lens. So in this case, the kind of the glow that's happening around the object, because remember when we looked at the sun, it was just like a round circle, but the kind of the glow that it has, the afterglow, not, not the streaks that look like sunlight, but the other stuff, the kind of purplish greenish glow, that's actually a reflection off of the low pass filter that's causing that. 
Uh, and so then we have names for all of this. We call that, that reflection the forward scatter halo. We call the stray light effect is what's causing the barrel shape and ghosting is what we call what's coming off of glass elements. And the diffraction that you see that kind of that star pattern is actually caused by the interaction of the light source and the iris of the lens because the iris has certain types of blades. And if you have uh, blades that open and close, depending if the lens is closed down or opened up, you're gonna see more or less of these diffraction patterns and they're gonna look like sunlight, you know, sunbeams that you would draw as a child. It's, that's what's gonna look like. And it'll get softer or, or more pronounced depending on what iris setting that you have. So it's the sum totality of all this that actually causes lens flares. Do we love lens flares? Yes, absolutely we do. When used properly in the right moments, this kind of strong light source that's going into the lens that causes a different type of lens flare, we've come to appreciate. I mean, it's a storytelling method. It's a, a major reason why people wanna use anamorphic lenses, for example. They're looking for a certain type of feel, look, uh, you know, and antithesis to reality. Now, is this for every cinematographer or for every job? No, absolutely not. There's some cinematographers that want a very, very clean look so that they don't want to have any kind of pronounced flare characteristics. They want just like a natural flare, kind of soft and, and not calling attention to itself. And others like the stuff like on the bottom right, where you have very distinct flare characteristics with distinct shapes because it helps tell the story. So it's really about taste at the end of the day. And I think the more choices you have in the market, the more interesting it becomes for the cinematographer. Now, this is like, if you look at this, you will see the, the flare characteristics uh, changing and moving around. I'll do it again one more time so you can see it. And you can see different colors that are highlighted as well that you see reflected back. Uh, let's talk about all that. So where is this all coming from? Um, what uh, lens flares is part of the storytelling. What is optical coding? Because this is really the trick to now controlling flare and ghosting characteristics. So Kat, before I move on, is there any questions or anything that we should uh, address? No questions so far. Okay, good. Either we're really good at this or people just, I don't know, don't like us or something. I'm not sure. But if you wanna ask a question at any time, please put in the Q and A. We would love to hear from you uh, and stop us at any time because you know we, we don't wanna make sure that we do anything or say anything that's going beyond uh, anyone's understanding right now. You should really have a clear picture. So let's talk about optical coding. Once we've defined flare characteristics, now let's look at how optical coding works. What is anti-reflective coding? Well, the whole idea of anti-reflective coding is that you wanna stop stray light reflections from elements bouncing around, okay? So if you look at this, uh, uh, what's it called, uh, example right here, you're looking at the front of the lens that has the optical coating on it, and then the, the back of the lens from the back side. And you notice that from the back side, you got a nice clear view. From the front side, you might see some reflections and things like that, but from the back, you don't. That's the whole idea with anti-reflective coating is that on the viewing side, you want it to be as clean as possible. That's always the, the idea of creating anti-reflective coatings. So here, let's take a look at an extreme example, right? An extreme example of, there's no coating on the lens at all in any of the elements versus the lens is coated the way that it was supposed to be, the way that it was designed. So when you look at the examples on the right side, you see the photograph of the, the guy uh, outside at the beer garden with the both lenses. So at first you see it with the optical coating. So there is optical coatings. You do see a faint reflection uh, because of the candle um, and you do see a flare characteristic kind of on the right side with that little red pattern over there, but you don't overall, you get a nice image with a long range of contrast from dark to white and lots of different color range, okay? The same lens without any coatings, any anti-reflective coatings on the right, it's an unusable image because the light bounces around so much inside, you're seeing lens elements, you're seeing the barrel, you're seeing you know the diffraction that we were saying, everything. It's all just there on display for you. And look at the image on the bottom in a, in a daylight situation, even though the sunlight is not directly hitting the lens, it's very tangential to the lens. A little bit of light like that is powerful enough to bounce around and really create all these lens flare characteristics. And by having the anti-reflective coating in the bottom left, you can see how beautiful that image could look and how that exposure is 
exactly like what the optical lens is intended to do, which is just be a magnification and capture reality and see it as clean as possible. So you see a big difference just from the anti-reflective coatings. And it's one type of technology. So where did anti-reflective coatings come from? Hey, Snehal, well, Snehal, actually, before we move on, I'm gonna make um, John Fay, Stephen, if you can make him a panelist temporarily. He had a question about lens flare and his experience. Sure. Hey, John Fay. Hey, John. Hey. Uh, hi. Um, I've seen a pattern of uh, little squares that I'd never seen before. And I'm thinking now from what you said earlier, it could more likely be from um, maybe the sensor because I'd never seen it in the lens before. Now, I have to say it was the first time, second time I had a, it was a, a 50 mil mm -hmm. Zeiss Milvis uh, and it was wide open and it was near sunlight, but it was a funny little pattern of lots of little squares. And I hadn't seen that before. Yeah, Stephen might be able to find an image online that shows this pattern. Uh, we've certainly recorded it. Yes, it's uh, that pattern you're seeing, if it's like a, almost like an egg crate or, or checkerboard pattern uh, of squares, yes. that is that is the sensor because this, the sensor is literally buckets with filters on top of it. So yeah. that's exactly the pattern you're seeing. And in fact, the, the colors are not exactly the same. If you look carefully, you might see like a green hue, a red hue, green hue, red hue, or different colors. Um, uh, in that pattern itself, in the, in the squares, but that is definitely the sensor being reflected. It's not the lens. I have a photo oh, here. Yeah. Yeah. Especially if you're wide open and, and have light going right, directly into it, it it's going to be the easiest way for that light to go all the way through and bounce back at you because the iris is wide open. As soon as you start closing it down, you're going to, you know, see less of that uh, phenomenon. Uh, we have a question. So the green and red hues are always the sensor? If it's in a square pattern, yes. I mean, if it literally looks like, I mean, uh, I think Stephen's gonna call up a picture, but if it, it looks like a, a pattern that's very, you know, structured and engineered, it's definitely not the lens like that. Yeah, exactly. Right here. Yes, you can that's see this on, on cell phones as well. A lot of times cell phones will have, um, and, and it's just kind of a magnification of each pixel in, in the mm -hmm. sensor reflecting off the OPF and back again. I can't zoom in, it takes me to another page, but this is what the OLPF looks like for a camera and it sits on front and you can see it's pink and, and green um, in this case. And so then you, you get those reflections, but other OLPFs are different color. The, the Komodo is blue. Um, I think the Sony Venice is bluish purple. Yeah, um, Alexa looks like greenish, I think when you look at it. Yeah, so that's, that's, that's uh, one of the things that you might see uh, when you're when you're looking at a, at an image that has a lot of strong light in it. Thanks cool. for the question, John. Thanks, John. So going back to um, uh, where did optical coatings come from? So optical coatings aren't new. They're, we've been around for quite some time. So the history for Zeiss is at least that we patented uh, our our version of the process um, in 1935, first time. And at that time, it was a single coating. It was called a T coating. And the first multi-coatings came later in the 18, 1950s. And that's when we start calling it MC for multi-coatings or T-star, as in more than one T-coating. Uh, the interesting thing was it started out at the very beginning, anti-reflective coatings were something that was necessary for submarines. And that's really from the periscope technology that Zeiss was involved with, that we first dove into this and our foray was for military application actually because when a periscope comes up in the middle of the night and there's a lighthouse uh the lighthouse when it spins the light around it basically blinds the the submarine for quite some time um as that strong light goes past if you don't have any anti-reflective coatings and because you could imagine in a periscope there's quite a few elements bouncing around that light to bring it back down inside the ship so that's where the first applications come from uh, and then later on, we started using these uh, T-star multi-layer coatings for just about everything, you know, from the 1950s onwards, you're using it just on every kind of optical uh, design and application because it's just necessary to get as good of an image as possible. 
Um, and it evolves. So every year that you, we, at Zeiss, we're always evolving it as new products are developed for all the different types of uh, optical stuff that we do outside of photography and cinematography. We also get the benefit of being able to tap into those, those, uh, that technology as well. Uh, that means that if you um, have a lens that was, you know, released two years ago versus a lens that was released 15 years ago, the lens from two years ago will have a better anti-reflective coating formula, if so desired, by the designers. So what, what is optical coating exactly? Well, it's like, you know, really, really small, tiny little, um, I don't know, Stephen, how would you describe it? It's, it's a layer of material that's basically, it's not just like a spray painted on, it's like a vacuum process to, to adhere it to the lens. Yeah, it's like it's almost like a fine ground up powder that instead of making something smooth, it can make it a little bit rougher so that it's breaking up the light into a different version or, or maybe it's a different color of a powder that's, that's um, you know, completely blocking out or soaking up that type of light. Um, it's different for every coating, but that's, um, very similar to like when you powder coat a car or something like that, you know, you, you put something on it and then suck it really tightly to the surface with static or with, with a vacuum in this case, so that it, it clings and then sticks and then coat it again and then smooth and polish it off. So it's kind of like a filter that you would have in front with a Tiffin glass or that kind of thing. Very good explanation. So over here, we're looking at an uncoated bare lens. And if you look on the right side, you notice that inside the lens, when there's glass elements, that are of low optical power, they'll still reflect at least 3% light back out. And the lenses with high optical power, the ones that have, you know, the more uh, curve to it, essentially, are going to reflect even more light out, 10, 11% light out. And this is throughout the spectrum, right? You can see that looking at the different wavelengths of light from 380 to 780, you're basically cutting out, just like Stephen said before, the visible spectrum of light uh, and the visible wavelengths from ultraviolet or uh, near ultraviolet to near infrared. And you notice that consistently the lens will reflect back. Light. So that's what an uncoated lens will do is that it will consistently always reflect back light, uh, at least to a certain degree. Now, the idea with the anti-reflective coating, and if you have one layer of coating, like this one layer that Stephen just described to you, you can uh, very effectively cut back the reflections of a good part of the spectrum, right? So with a single T coating, we're very good at maybe cutting back the spectrum of blue to green light but not very good at cutting back the spectrum of orange to red to magenta. So what does that result in is that you're gonna get a reflection of orange, red, magenta, and that will reflect more and it'll cause flare characteristics that are in that color, whereas the blue will transmit better. So at the end, is your image gonna be cool or warm? Does anyone know? Is anyone answering in the chat? No guesses yet, uh, <laughs> depending on the lens, Ruud said. No, not depending on the lens. Look at the anti-reflective coating. If I'm cutting out the spectrums, if I'm allowing the transmission of blue greens, but the reflections I can't cut of the orange and red, what will the resulting image be look like? It'll be more bluish. It would be a lot cooler because the blue lights being transmitted through the lens very easily, and the other stuff's being reflected back out. So you would have warm flares with, hey, John Fay, there you go. Cool with warm flares, absolutely. That's exactly what you would have. And in fact, if you look at the front of the lens, you're gonna see a lot of warm reflections, right? From, from straight light. So that's what happens with the single coating. Now, if you have multiple coatings, what ends up happening? Well, now you can cut back a bigger swath of wavelengths of, of the visible spectrum. So you will get very little reflection overall for most of the spectrum, but maybe pieces of it are still hard to do, okay? And that's the reality of where we are with anti-reflective coatings today. We're very good at cutting like a good 75% of the chunk of the wavelengths of light or maybe 80% of the chunk. We're like almost exact at it. We can make sure the light transmission is almost perfect, but there's still pieces that are not getting cut. And this is not necessarily representative of what's happening to a real lens. It's just an example with this chart and the wavelengths of light of what T-star is. The idea with the multi-coatings is that you bring down all of the transmission 
uh, uh, bring down, sorry, all the reflections to the point where the transmission is really, really good. And that's how you get a nice fast lens that has a clean look that doesn't flare very, very easily. And even when hit with direct light, it has a nice soft response to it. And that's really what, what we're seeing here in this um, animation is the Supreme Prime lenses. That's how they're designed. They're designed to have the best anti-reflective coatings that we can, still maintain a cinematic look, but really, you know, good performance. That's the whole idea. Then on the other end of it, you can now, with present day technology, pick and choose how, what part of the spectrum you want reflected. And that's what we did with the Supreme Prime Radiance is we're choosing to reflect a narrow band of blue spectrum and cutting everything else. So what is the result if you allow blue to be reflected back out and everything else to transmit better? Then what? You're gonna have uh, a resulting warmer image with blue lens characteristics or blue flare characteristics. And that's exactly what happens with the Supreme Prime Radiance is that they are overall, even when there's no light being directly hitting the lens, it's still overall a slightly warmer in, in the color temperature scale than a regular Supreme Prime lens, right? Does that make sense? Evan Parquet wants to know if you lose any stops from the coatings. Yes, let's uh, bring them in because that's the next section. Okay, perfect. Steven, if we can bring him in. So Evan's asking the questions that are very, very relevant right now is what is the, the loss of light uh, from coating? So the in interesting thing is, is that what impact has optical coatings on light transmission? In reality, optical coatings don't impact the transmission of light at all negatively. It's actually positive because here's the real difference. So Evan, how are you doing? Uh, good. Thanks for answering my question. Thanks for, for sure. Care. For sure. Uh, does this chart make sense? I'll, I'll explain it to you and then maybe you can tell us if it makes sense. Evan. Yeah. So if, if, if all of my elements were coated with anti-reflective coating, I got the best light transmission possible. I can achieve with the Supreme Prime 21 lens design that we now have, which has 14 uh, elements and 28 optical surfaces, we can achieve a T15. Mm. If we uncoat the front lens and the back lens, the front element and real element, we lose light transmission because some of the light is being lost to reflections. So now we're at T17. And if we get rid of 50% of the coatings on 50% of the elements, we're down to T21. And we uncoat it completely, it's T29. And not only is it T29, but it's practically unusable as we saw from our previous examples to do it on one. Wow. So the reality the opposite of what he asked, because he's saying, are you losing stops from the coatings? Yeah. You're actually gaining because you're able to get more light in. Right. So in a theoretical, theoretical space that you can argue, well, you know, you put a coating on, so it does slow down the light a tiny little mm -hmm. bit. But the fact of the matter is that whatever slow the coating does to slow things down, it, it the opposite effect is already happening that it allows the transmission light so much better that it doesn't matter that okay. it won't matter because if you have an uncoated lens it's going to bounce back out so what difference does it make if the coating yeah, true. is detrimental okay. or not it's like on a magnitude of like a million to one right yeah does that make okay. sense yeah, yeah you're retaining more light with the coatings okay that makes exactly. sense yeah cool Perfect. do you have any other uh anti-reflective coating questions <laughs> uh if i do i'll i'll uh, i'll ask cool thanks, thanks for joining us yeah. evan much appreciated. So what is the impact of optical coating on light transmission? All right, T-star coated, uncoated. There is no light source that's here. There's no tangential light source. This should be a real easy image for the lens to capture, but it still struggles with it when it's uncoated because it, there's too much light, even in this scenario, bouncing back to allow for a good exposure. Now, it's even worse when there's like a tiny little bit of reflected light. It just kind of ghosts the image altogether and grays it out. So not only does it reduce the exposure, but then re reduces all your black levels so that you're not really getting a good contrast range. You're just getting a very narrow contrast range. Uh, washes out the image is what we call it. And you can see that quite clearly in this example too. And then obviously with the light source, it's the worst because not only do you get loss in exposure and all the other detriments, but now it goes so much that you just can't see the image. So there's a big difference um, in using an uncoated and coated lenses. 
So, all right, good. We're at a good spot. Any questions uh, at, uh, up until now? Yeah, we have a couple actually. Peter White was asking if flares are a chromatic aberration. No, no. Chromatic aberration is your light transmitting and not uh, all three uh, or the, the whole spectrum of light is not hitting the sensor all at the same time. And chromatic aberration, that separation that you see, um, you know, around especially high contrast images like between brighter or dark is a function of optical design and not, not a function of uh, coatings. Now, the color that you see tends to, you know, be similar, very, very similar between the two, of course, um, because, you know, you're talking about the same elements in the same glass and the same colors and all that stuff. But in reality, the reason you're getting separation of colors is only because the light's not transmitting at the exact same time. So some spectrum of light is reaching the sensor faster than other spectrum of light is. And that's what causes uh, chromatic aberration. Cool. Okay, and the, the next question comes again from John Fay. Is T-Star only on Supreme Primes? No, we use T-Star coatings uh, on just about everything. Uh, on all professional level equipment has T-Star coating in one sort or another. But guess what? It's not the same powder combination. It's very specific. We call it T-Star as an umbrella, but T-Star just means multi-layer coating. It doesn't specify for that application. For each lens design that we have, ultra primes of Airy and Zeiss, master primes of Airy Zeiss, uh, master anamorphic Airy Zeiss, uh, supreme prime Zeiss, supreme uh, prime radiance Zeiss, CP3s, everyone gets their own formulation, okay? This is even indicated in master primes because they literally called it T-Star XP, I think that's what it was, um, just because uh, to set it off and say, hey, this is a special version, a cinematic formulation of T-Star that we specifically want for a specific type of look. And a master prime, when you open up the lens all the way, has a slightly more decontrasted look than a modern lens like a CP3 or a Supreme Prime, but it's by design. So in reality, the T-Star technology develops, we call it T-Star as an umbrella, but each lens application is separate. So let's take a look at the whole line of Supreme Prime lenses. Each lens is having different formulations of T-Star to achieve the exact same look. So we want the consistent look. We want everything to look the same. What we try to do is tweak all the knobs to try to get the coating matching up. And the problem is that you're not just looking at it from one focal length to another. You're actually looking at each glass element is getting its own formulation of T-Star coating. So inside the 21 millimeter lens, in reality, you could have up to 28 different coating types if you want. Some optical elements get coated on one side, some get coated on two, some don't get coated at all. All these choices you have to make when you're designing optically, you have so many different variations, you know, thousands upon thousands of variations of what you can do. So you have to make choices. T-Star is an umbrella. It's not the exact application or formula. It's just the concept of anti-reflective coatings from Zeiss are called T-Star. And can you go back one slide to show an uncoated lens there for a second? Yeah. Um, one of the most important to note is that um, a lot of the older lenses, you're dealing with the coating and everybody loves flares, but usually on a vintage lens with a flare, you're getting it because of the uncoated either front or back element. That's the easiest one for people to adjust or, or, or rearrange. And so again, the, the visual the usability of an image like that when you're dealing with a vintage lens, you get the benefit of having that cool flare, but then as far as coloring that particular image, how would you do it? Because everything's really, really washed out. So it's really difficult when you're dealing with vintage lenses, especially people just throw them on because they like the flare on that, but they don't understand kind of what, what goes along with that a lot of the time. Yeah, it's a good point. You have to watch your contrast levels. There are applications where it makes sense to do uncoated super speed lenses, but there are times where it's going to be making you very difficult for you to get your, you know, close up shot on the 85 uh, if every tiny little light source is just causing a ghost. So you have to be cognizant of that uh, when you're making those choices. And I would encourage you, and I think we would all encourage you to test, you know, so anytime you're doing a new project or something, it's awesome that you can choose all these different tools, but make sure you test to see actually what you're getting uh, and be aware of it. Um, and again, the image that we're seeing here on the, the right is multiple lenses uncoated. This is like the whole glass is uncoated, all, all the elements in the lens. It's not necessarily the kind of image you get from a, a vintage lens, but the point is there is that you have to be careful of what the detrimental effects can be. Um, so 
taking all this into, oh, do we have any other questions that we should uh, get to before? Yeah, we have quite a few. Did you want oh, okay. to test them all? Yeah, 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 sure. Okay, perfect. Um, Andrew Park was asking if there's a lifespan of the coding. Lifespan of the coding. Okay, so can coatings change over time? Yes, depending on what materials are made. Obviously, coatings that we create nowadays would last much longer than we did maybe 50 years ago. So, yes. And the fungal thing he's asking about is different as well. A lot of lenses have really good protection from water and older lenses don't always have that. So like in our lenses, if you open them up, you'll see a little baffle or, or a rubber stop or something to keep water out. Usually it's felt or something like that. Older lenses don't have any of that. So the fungal growth, you can throw it in the attic and you assume your lens will be fine. About 10 years later, it's going to be really moldy or fungal or whatever. That's, that's a different than the element itself. Okay, perfect. And then uh, Jody Savitz, I think we covered a couple of her questions, but um, just in case, is there a percentage of elements that are typically, typically coded um, in a coded versus uncoded? I'm guessing it's not zero or 100%. It's not necessarily 100 because you might have elements of glass that are glued together. And in case, in that case, you would maybe just coat the, the, one, the outer one. Uh, we call those elements groups when we glue them together. So it just depends. And honestly, I can't speak to what's happening in each element because even I don't know. Uh, I'm not, I, I don't have the knowledge of the engineering level of uh, 13 different focal lengths and each element that's inside there. I mean, it's just way too much information for and for anyone that, that is not on the design side to have. So in reality, none of us are actually aware of exactly how many elements at a, you know, each particular focal length is actually coded. All we know is that the T star that we did and the transmission light transmission we did was done in such a way to result in a T15 image, for example. So that's, we can tell that. Um, we have some information, you know, like uh, we know for the radiance that there are like typically five or six elements chosen, but we'll, we'll get to that, that part. That part we know because it's part of the marketing speak, but honestly, we don't know to the engineering level uh, exactly the application, nor do we really want to know because we shouldn't be talking about that. There are some things that should be trade secrets and in an optical world, optical designs are not trade secrets anymore. I mean, most of manufacturers are using uh, older Zeiss optical designs from 75 years ago um, and selling new lenses to this day and vice versa. You know, we're using optical designs from other manufacturers from 30, 40, 50, 60 years ago as well. That's not the stuff that's the secret. The secret of sauce is the coatings. That's probably the one of the biggest uh, things that set apart one cinema lens company manufacturer from another. It's the ability to work with optical coatings, matte black finish on the inside of the lens. And then on top of that, everything else that you do for optical design for the barrel, uh, all those mechanics. Um, that's the stuff that, that people are very protective about in this industry. John Faye's got a good question. Uh, will Zeiss cleaning fluid or, or Pancro remove the coating eventually? Anything would, I mean, any kind of abrasive would. Well, we always tell people don't wipe your lenses. <laughs> you know, we don't use, we don't try to use lens wipes on our cinema lenses. We try to use the, the, the blower as much as possible and maybe a brush for the worst stuff. Um, of course, it's different when you're you know, dealing with dirt and stuff and, and, and things like that in a rental environment, but we try the least amount of times as possible to wipe. You should never be wiping, especially in a circle. Um, a lens with any kind of cloth, especially microfiber. I mean, you think that that stuff is uh, good for the lens, but in reality, microfiber holds a lot of dust and dirt and uh, can affect it too. So we try to avoid it if at all possible. And of course there's an occasional wipe here or there, but that's not something we try to do. Stephen, am I right about that? Oh uh, yeah, correct. Another question from Jet Rider. Does ICE have any lens options within the Halide FX system? It's a it's a onset FX camera, VFX camera tracking lens library. Well, that's all up to the the users of, the, of whoever makes that company. You know, they're they're the ones that are choosing what their lens tracking lenses are. We have a lot of lenses that people use for visual effects and and um, virtual production and stuff like that. Uh, and with our new technology, with our XD technology, which we'll say for a different presentation, or you can look it up on our website or YouTube, we do have metadata technology that transmits live the lens. And what we're trying to do with VFX systems is make it so you don't have to profile a lens, that you have the lens profile built in electronically into your video footage. And we've accomplished that with Red DSMC2 cameras and with Sony Venice. And we have a lot of TV shows, movies, and even our own production which is you know, being considered for an Oscar right now called Stucco, which we use this metadata technology. 
can, will there be lens more lens profiles in the future for like vintage lenses and stuff? I mean, that's exactly what people are trying to do. I think right now is they grab profiles of lenses and try to store them in a, store them in a database. And I think that uh, Jet, you're, you're hitting upon something that is coming in the future. I think more information about what optics are doing uh, in a real world, uh, in the real world, so that you can emulate it in the virtual world. So it's a very important thing. Absolutely. Are, are we doing it right now with our lenses? No, not necessarily. We're trying to provide you active data from lenses that you use on set. Whereas I think the question you're asking is more, it can be used for anything, for any lens, a smart lens or a not smart lens. I hope that answers that question. All right. So taking all this information that we had about how lens flares were created, and how we can manipulate the colors and the look of the lens flares, we're now looking at, okay, just like Steven mentioned, there's a big drive for vintage lenses because they give you cool looks and interesting looks. And we know that. And we know that there's a demand in the market, especially in Super 35, for a chunk of lenses that were manufactured between the 1950s and 1990s. And Zeiss Super Speeds, Mark 1, 2s, and 3s, T2 1s, they're part of this mix of lenses that people are, that's desirable. But the problem is that classic lenses are often unreliable, unreliable, difficult to service. You have to rehouse a lot of times, especially with nowadays when you're using electronic motor systems with high torque. And on top of that, the coverage, right? They cover Super 35 most of the time up until now, and then not necessarily the full frame format, the larger sensor. Yes, some focal lengths might work on a larger sensor with some detriments, darker edges. You know, you don't have the nice exposure from center to edge that you would for a full frame lens but you couldn't use all the focal lengths of the Super 35 lenses on a larger sensor. So in the larger sensor, you have less choices of these cool, funky designs to be able to use, right? And you don't have a lot of modern glass. You have some, you don't have a lot of modern glass that can stand up to the rigors of, of the way we work now on set. So that's where the onus came in for us to research. What is the kind of characteristics and flares and things that people like to see? And so Benjamin Volker, Dr. Benjamin Volker on the bottom left, they got the striped shirt. We went to Keslo camera and they became our partner for development for the radiance lenses in the US. And we went to another rental house in France called RVZ or RVZ. And they were the ones that partnered with us in Europe. And the two of them gave us access and allow the research to happen. So Benjamin Volker, went through, Dr. Volker went through and said, okay, well, these are the most rented lenses that you have in the vintage sphere between 1950s and 1990s. Let's take a look at all of them. Let's see what their characteristics are and learn something. And that's exactly what we did. <coughs> Try to consider things like the intensity of the flare, the color, the shape, the behavior when stopping down the lens, position and frame with respect to the light source and the effect of the overall contrast. These were things that we were measuring. Uh, on these systems. And then we said, okay, well, if we're gonna make a Supreme Prime Radiance lenses, we can't just uncoat some lenses and call it a day. That, that's not gonna work. We have to be able to actually create a look because there's too many disadvantages to just messing around with uncoating some stuff and calling it a day. We wanna create our own look that's consistent over the lens, whole lens family, controllable, has the right amount of intensity and very, very low light transmission loss meaning that it doesn't slow down the lens a lot, okay? So this is what we're looking for. And we're looking at the characteristics that we saw from the vintage lenses and seeing what we like from that or what cinematographers like more than what we like actually, and see if we can recreate that. And then the onus was, all right, what we can do is use the technology of the anti-reflective coating, choose lens elements that we would like to maybe experiment with and then create the ghosts or the flare characteristics and hopefully match it between all the focal lengths of lenses that we want to create. Now we had already planned a Supreme Prime line of lenses, which were 13 focal lengths and now it's actually going to be 14 focal lengths this year. But we took a subset of that because it's a very tough project of seven focal lengths from 21 to 100 and figure out what we can do with them. And you can't just change all the coatings because if you change all the coating, it'll be super blue. Like if you did 14 elements in that 21 millimeter lens, you're gonna get 406 individual ghosts. But if you do five of the elements, you get 55 individual ghosts. So we decided to do six surfaces to be changed uh, in the 14 elements line, like the SP21, okay? So, but there are, depending on which six surfaces you choose, up to 200 million combinations possible. This is crazy. Like, how do we get there? 
okay? It could only be solved if we simulate what is happening. So if you choose and pick different elements, you want to simulate in a computer to see what kind of flare characteristics it's going to result in and then make a prototype. Because if you just try to make prototypes and say, okay, well, in this prototype 21 millimeter, we're going to do these six surfaces. And in this prototype, we'll do these other six. Or we'll be going through thousands of prototypes and we'll never get there. And no one's ever going to give us money to research that kind of project because you'll never be able to earn that back. It'll take a really long time, a lot of time and effort and mechanics and just won't get us there. So the best thing to do is actually use a supercomputing technology that we acquired in 2015. So mind you, before 2015, this would not have even been possible. But this supercomputing technology uses AI to actually simulate exactly what kind of flare characteristic you would get for different individual choices you make in lens elements and coding. So what we did was like, for example, on the top right, you see the Supreme Prime 21 and there's 14 elements. And what they did was they chose which elements uh, to ghost and uh, create with uh, choosing six of them with a different type of coding. And the bottom image is what resulted in it, okay? So that's what's really interesting uh, about this kind of emulation is you can see beforehand, is this gonna work? Is this gonna give me that kind of pattern of uh, flares that I'm looking for? And so you simulate it first. So normally we would have used this AI simulation to eliminate uh, ghosts. We would have tried to figure out like for a microscope or telescope, what elements we should coat, you know, more aggressively or less aggressively to get no reflections at all. But now we're going the opposite way and trying to emulate reflections. So that's what we did. And then we tried all kinds of different combinations of, of you know, different types of formulations of coatings and things like that <clears throat> and did umpteen simulations that we can do. Now these simulations are still time intensive. It still takes like overnight to run some of these simulations, uh, even on the supercomputer, because there's a lot of math and lots of microscopic points of light that are being tracked through the lens optics to get here. But eventually we are able to get to this, which is each one of the focal lengths are now becoming consistent with one another. So the kind of flare characteristics you're getting on one focal length, one magnification, you're getting very something very similar on another. And it was consistent even uh, uh, if you change the T-stop. So you get, you know, if you go from T15 to T28 to T56, you can see that the lens characteristics, flare characteristics become more distinctive, but they're still retaining the same type of shape and layout that you were getting even wide open. So very, very consistent, uh, very much, um, you know, something cool to see, but again, this was just a simulation. And then what we had to do was then now create the prototypes. After umpteen trials on the computer, we finally are satisfied. So we created the Supreme Prime 35 uh, prototype, shot it on a full frame camera, the Sony Venice, put the exact same light source in the exact same position. And it looks almost exactly like the simulation. That is an incredible feat that we were able to develop this lens technology without creating prototypes until we really needed that. And that saved us the time and money to be able to economically do this project. Uh, and the result is you now have a full set of lenses from right now from 21 to 100, and there's more focal lights coming out this year that have this consistent look. And this is an image of the actual lenses. So this is actual prototypes that have been shot in the real world and they very much resemble the simulation that we did. So we were able to literally use just modifications of anti-reflective coatings to create a set of lenses that has lens characteristics that people find desirable. And the result is because you output, you know, reflect a little bit of blue light back is that your overall image is warmer. So uh, in this comparison, you could actually see that uh, the difference between the two, so this is, of course, the radiance lens. And then if you show the regular Supreme Prime, it just doesn't flare the same exact way. It, it really is nice soft flare, you know, um, controlled light as much as possible, good contrast range. And the radiance really has fun with the blue spectrum. It really lights up that blue spectrum way more than you're seeing in a regular Supreme Prime. And that's the interesting thing about the radiance. And so the overall image you'll notice is a bit warmer too. So this is the radiance shot. And you'll notice this white cube when they show it again will look cooler with the regular Supreme Prime. That's because the radiance overall is a warmer image 
because it's transmitting. So now here, of course, it looks cooler. It doesn't look as warm as it did before. So there's that slight bit of difference in, in color temperature with the regular Supreme Prime, which is designed to transmit light as well as possible without hindering anything. And the radiance, which is meant to hinder the blue spectrum of light. Even here, when there's colored lights, you're still getting blue tinges too. So it's a really, really interesting uh, lens series. It's, it's something that took uh, time to develop, but you know the results are really what we were looking for. Uh, it's had really nice acceptance from the market. Um, we have delivered less sets than we would have liked to, of course, because of the pandemic, quite frankly. Uh, but the owners that have them, they, uh, they don't stay on the shelves. So we've had a number of TV shows that have used them already. Uh, <coughs> excuse me, sorry, something tickled my nose. Uh, we have uh, uh, lots of uh, TV shows that used them like uh, Motherland Fort Salem, uh, John Joffin, he used it. The, he shot the whole uh, first season with uh, Supreme Primes, but the last two, um, he was able to use, uh, um, use with, uh, what's it called, uh, uh, radiance. So the two last two episodes of the season were, were radiance lenses. Uh, of course, we see here Rodrigo Prieto he used it for his short film. Um, we had uh, Data Gonzalez and team use it for Fargo season four. So the whole TV show series, uh, season four of Fargo is Supreme Prime Radiance lenses. That's the primary lens on that, that series. Uh, yeah, so, and, and plus tons of commercials and stuff and lots of stuff coming out. Um, Kat, can you put a, maybe a link to our Zeiss Cinematography page? Uh, we have a, a YouTube a playlist actually, that's called uh, Shot on uh, Supremes and then another one Shot on Radiance. So yeah, you can sure, see all I can add of, those to the chat. Yeah, it's all kinds of projects, TV shows, movies, commercials from all over the world that are using the lens. So you can kind of see what other people are doing with it. But uh, yeah, it's, uh, it, it's, it's been an interesting ride. Or oh, you can watch this uh, short film as well uh, from Ghost, uh, the, what's it called? Uh, all Blood Runs Red, uh, directed by Paul Mignot. And that was a, a beautiful short film that really made use of the lens characteristics as well. Uh, shot on a Red, that's Shot on a Red Monster, I believe. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's really widely accepted. People like it. We would love to show it off more often at uh, at the at the uh, demo center. Uh, unfortunately, because of the pandemic shutdown, we, our office is not open. But you know, we do send out. If you have a job coming up at a rental house and they don't own the lenses, we do send them out for you to test out. So that's not a problem. One of the things that I think makes this so big is the fact that you're seeing the flares and you're not seeing the characteristics of lenses that usually have those flares and the stuff that's not desirable. So it's not just what you're seeing in that there's a blue hue, but you're not seeing all the ghosting. You're not seeing you know, the, the metal barrel distortion and, and, and this kind of stuff that's going on. You're just seeing the flare itself. So you can actually specifically use that flare like you would a paintbrush and not have all the other effects of, of blowing light out and losing sharpness and you know, contrast and that type of thing. That's really what you need to see in person if you're going to study the lens because it's it's, you really have to have hands on to see how close you have to get with a flashlight to get that flare. And you don't, you can, you still have perfect sharpness on everything behind the flare, which is really, really rare. I don't know any other lens set that does that. Yeah, quite unique and a really good manipulation of technology. It really is. That's what it's about is that we just use technology to, to be able to manipulate to, to get a desirable effect. And it's a nice lesson because at the end of the day, we're, you know, the lens has to be created for the artist and it have to, has to have the artist in mind. And if that's the kind of paintbrush that they're asking for, you know, it behooves us to listen and say, hey, okay, look, not only can you get a lens with a clean look with the Supreme Primes, you know, I have regular Supreme Prime here and the radiance looks exactly like this lens. Like there's nothing different in terms of physically on the outside of the lens, except for some markings that tell us it's a radiance lens, but really the technology in the inside of the lens is different. And now we have choices. So you got a clean look if you want, you got a lens flare look if you want, or you can do both. You can have two sets on set and, and use them differently at different times of your production. It's whatever choice you want. Now we have seen some hot rotting of the Supreme Primes too. Let's not forget about that. That some people take off the front element because this front element is actually quite easy to remove if you're a lens tech. The design that we have now, the lens barrels, it's one of the most serviceable lenses we've ever created, this and the CP3s, because you can really get to the nitty gritty and fix this and get, get into it pretty easily. And we do trainings for lens techs uh, on the voice, do it quite regularly 
uh, before the pandemic, and we will again, uh, in-person trainings and digital trainings that allow them to actually get into the lens and do a lot of these cool things. One of the things that's very common for just about every rental house is they'll take a, a set of regular Supremes, they'll buy a spare front element, they'll uncoat it and recoat it the way they want. And what that ends up doing is creating a unique look. Maybe it is just like Steven said, they use it to kind of soften up the edges around uh, bright objects or kind of adding more of like a pro mist type of feel to it or whatever. They kind of bake in something so that your lens has that quality. So if you go to Camtech, if you go to Panavision, Keslo, Auto, uh, you know, even any, the camera division, these are all LA houses, but let's talk about even New York, TCS, or if you go to Area Rental, they all do this stuff. They all send stuff to Duclos or, or another lens uh, repair shop um, and they create this kind of like artistic solutions. And what they're doing is they're changing and they're just making variations of the same thing. So they're not taking this element and then changing it with something that would change the image, like the shape of the image or, the, or anything like that. They're retaining that, they're just messing with the coatings. And that's really the main modification that most rental houses will do. They'll either uncoat the lens completely the front element or they'll mess around with the front element. It's very, very, very common. Um, and it's cool. We think it's great. We love when people hot rod our stuff. That's, a, that's amazing. You should personalize it. And cinematographers will always get that choice. I mean, that's why you go to a high-end rental house. That's why you go seeking out your favorite um, lens tech uh, or your or manager or service manager at different rental houses because you know that they're going to back you up and, and help you out you know, um, and help you create something unique. And that's a lot of times you're trying to put a finger or thumbprint on, on your projects. And it's really important to understand this process, I think. Yeah, so I'm ready for questions. What about you guys? So Snail, hopefully you're a fan of The Crown or you've seen it because Eric Anderson was hoping you could um, tell him about the look of the lenses used in The Crown. It was a Sony F55 and Cook Pancros. Oh, Cook Pancros are great. Um, so Cook Pancros, I mean, there's two life, right? Like it had a life as, a, as an older vintage lens. Uh, and then um, when Les Sellen uh, was involved with Cook more recently, he brought them back, right? So that you, you have two versions of those. The Pancros are just doing that. They're, they're really, uh, it's a different formulation of coding. So let's talk about Cook overall and just the Cook look right? In general, let's keep it general because I don't want to speak specifically on this movie, but I know what, what people are seeing, I think, overall when they mention Cook. It's a certain type of look. It's like this like, yellowish look or this feel, uh, the skin. Um, it's beautiful. It's absolutely gorgeous. And that look, they do it on purpose. <laughs> I mean, they could, if they wanted to, put anti-reflective coatings that will transmit a cleaner lens, but then people will say that, well, that's really cool because that's what they say sometimes about Zeiss lenses is that they're cool in comparison. And the reality is, well, the Zeiss lens is more neutral in comparison a lot of the times. Like an ultra prime is way more neutral than a lot of its com competition 20 years ago. So a lot of the company like Cook, you know, S4s for example, are warmer. So, or, or the yellow scale. So they're designed to do that. And the Cook look is actually the formulation of the coatings plus the glass element choices that they make together to create that look. And they wanna keep it that way and they should. Um, that's what people want. Uh, that's why you have different manufacturers with different processes is that you get to have a choice. And I think that's the best thing about being a cinematographer is that you have all these paintbrushes. You can choose whatever you like. None of us will get mad. We're never gonna get mad if you don't use our lenses that project. As long as we're in the mix. <laughs> Do you know if some of the cook look is also due to the age of those coatings as well? Has that made it a little change over time to where it's harder to uh, manufacture or? Uh, yes. Yeah, the, the classic cook uh, pancros, you can't recreate that look. So they did a very, very, very good job with the new one. But they had to change stuff because they weren't using the same. So sometimes we had lead in the powder that Stephen was talking about back in the day for anti-reflective coatings because that was a metal that lasts forever, right? So sometimes that was used and that ages and, and oxidizes and changes color. So sometimes you might... Hmm? I was curious, I've heard of rumors of other lenses that are slightly radioactive, is that true? Yeah, yeah, there are, there are. There are plenty of lenses that are radioactive, uh, especially older ones. Now, is it radioactive enough to hurt you? No, but it could have detrimental effects on electronics and all other stuff as well too. Um, that is from coatings. That is from coatings. So yes, we've used all kinds of materials for coatings in the past. 
And now what we're using is probably the safest stuff that we have so far uh, that really isn't de detrimental to the environment or to people, which is really important to, to know that, right? It's really not detrimental to the environment or people, but it's different. So if you make a cook speed pan pro now, <clears throat> compared to many years ago, you're not gonna get the exact same result because of the coatings they use. But if I wanted to make a brand new Cook S5 today versus when they first started manufacturing, I bet you it's almost exactly the same because that's also what we do at Zeiss. So I can't speak for Cook. Let me not try to speak for Cook because I don't work for that company. I work for Zeiss. Let me just tell you what we do. The formulation of coatings and anti-reflective coatings for each element of an ultra prime has never changed. We've never upgraded and put a newer version of T-Star Cody on any element of any ultra prime lens, even if we manufacture it today. It gets the exact same formulation it had 20 years ago when it was first created. Same thing with Master Prime. We do not change the formulation because in Zeiss, if you change anything as major as that, as a formulation of anti reflective you have to call it a Mark II. It must change into a new line of lenses. We cannot call it the same lens. So any change in formulation has to be consistent. So are there slight differences? Yeah, there could be slight differences, but it should not be a significant change. Theoretically, I should be able to have a set of ultra primes about 20 years ago, use them and kept them in really good condition, not like scratched up or anything like that, but really good condition and buy an element because I got stolen, a 21 was stolen from my, or you know, or 30, 35 millimeter was stolen from set. I should be able to replace it with a brand new 35 millimeter. And it has to work with a set that already exists. You're not gonna get consistency if you change anything. So we don't change anything. So that means the Supreme Primes, when they came out just a few years ago, are gonna have the latest version of anti-reflective coating that's possibly available to Zeiss, okay? So it will have a different formulation from T-Star coatings of a Master Prime, Master Anamorphic, Ultra Prime Lens, T21, Super Speeds. It's just the nature of it. But it'll stay the same. The whole time Supreme Primes are manufactured, they'll have the same coating. I can dunk a lens accidentally during a job because the water housing busted, replace that lens five years later, and it should match with the rest of the set. That's the only way we could work in our industry. Otherwise it wouldn't work. So, you know, I know for a fact Zeiss does this and we have very good reason to think that everyone does this, that, you know, when you buy a lens uh, from a high-end manufacturer, you're getting consistency. That's really, really important. Good questions, really good questions. Eric Anderson is also asking if you can discuss zoom lenses. Uh, yeah, do we wanna bring Eric in? Sure. Yeah, let's do that. Eric's on here twice, so I'm gonna allow to talk both and one of those will work. Hey, Eric. He's having a tough time choosing which one to unmute. Oh, yeah. There we go. <laughs> How you doing, Eric? I'm very well. Sorry for all the questions, but uh, how else are we going to learn? Exactly. Absolutely. We agree with you. What's your question, my friend? Uh, oh, well, Zoom lenses. Uh, you know, when I work in uh, mostly in television uh, uh, series type work or movies of the week. And uh, because of time, uh, we use the Zoom a lot. Mm hmm um, I don't know, does Zeiss have, do you have zoom lenses? If, I can't remember if you have any at all. I don't think oh, so. yeah. Well, oh, we do. have, yeah, we do. Okay. We've had zoom lenses, uh, uh, we, I mean, we have four current zoom lenses, but we've always had zoom lenses. Okay, okay. I apologize for not knowing. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I guess the question is, uh, talk, can you talk a little bit about the flare characteristics on the zooms and uh, Cody? Absolutely. Coding, uh, the, the, the reason I asked uh, about the crown is that they have, you know, they have a lot of shots. With, a lot of it's just shot. I don't know exactly how, but they, they just use window light a lot. And then they sort of have a little bit of that on the edge of the shot and it kind of bleeds through. Um, it, it, and and you, you know, there's a, a source, but it's not in the shot. And that that's what I was asking about the, the cook look I, the color and all i probably 
you know, I couldn't tell on my colors or what exactly the warmth is, but the yeah. sign, I'd be interested in that sign. Uh, I'd have to take a look at that the shot from the crown, and I, I couldn't speak to it off the bat. But to answer, they use it all through the show. Okay, I'll, I could take a look at it. Um, but to answer your question about zooms, yes, it's zooms are way more complicated because uh, <laughs> zooms zooms are essentially it's a variable prime that keeps its focus as you fo uh, zoom through the range. That's the the modern definition of a good cinema lens. So, cinema zoom lens is that it's par focal that it'll it'll stick to focusing uh, consistently through your zoom range as you zoom. It's necessary for cinematic applications for it to do that. Yeah. There's a lot of elements involved. There's a lot of stuff moving around. You're changing magnification when you change focal lengths. And that's what the zoom lets you do in real time is, is actually change focal lengths, it's change magnifications. So you have so much more going on. You have to be much more careful with your choices of anti-reflective coatings. Um, and you're gonna have a big light transmission loss. Uh, and, and you'll notice that a lot of zoom lenses, they'll even continue to lose light transmission as they zoom in because so many elements are moving at the end of the day that your light transmission is not exactly the same throughout the whole zoom range. That's something that's completely normal and, and understood because all zoom lenses do that to some degree. Right. Um, how much of it's acceptable to you, you'll have to figure out. But really they all do a tiny little bit at least uh, of changing of the exposure. So what ends up happening with uh, those zoom lenses, you gotta make some really tough decisions with zoom lenses. You gotta be able to compromise. You're never gonna get the performance pound for pound of a zoom versus a prime. This is not gonna happen. Prime lens has way less elements. It's much cleaner design. And it's only meant to do one focal length, one magnification. So you can dedicate it itself to that. The problem with the zoom is that if you have all these different magnifications, you make compromises along the way. You allow some parts of the magnification, the distortion will be outward and some will be inwards or you know, different method, different things going on as you zoom in or zoom out. Uh, you're also gonna have different exposure levels. You're gonna have from the center of the frame to the edge might be different as you zoom in or zoom out as well. So a lot of these things are gonna happen. So how do you keep it consistent as possible? Very good anti-reflective coatings. You generally don't find, you know, um, compromise there. We try our best to, to get that, that. And then the iris shape. So you tend to try to make as many blades as possible. So a lot of our zoom lenses, like our, our full frame uh, compact zooms, and we have three of them, 15 to 30, 20 to 80, 70 to 200, they have 18 blade iris. So you make that bouquet as round as possible, least amount of diffraction as possible to call attention to flare characteristics. So we really try to control it. And what ends up happening is if you do it right, you have a nice big contrast range. With the size CZ2s, they have a very good contrast range. Yes, they don't have the same distortion characteristics. They're not as clean and straight as a prime lens, but they perform really well. They match quite well with the Supreme Prime or Supreme Prime Radiance or backwards compatible with Master Primes and Ultra Primes. So I think it's it's way more complicated for Zooms. It takes longer to figure out, for sure. Okay, does that explain... Um, uh does that explain why sometimes uh, uh, some manufacturers have a set of two or three zooms uh, to cover? Like a range, yeah. Because it's the, it gives a better quality. Oh, absolutely. I mean, yeah, uh, look, you're gonna use a 24 to 290 on set, not because of the quality, you're gonna use it for practicality. Uh, yeah, I haven't. I, I don't know if any uh, <laughs> uh, cinematographer is going to argue that point. No, no, yeah, okay, all right. Yeah, this was you know, good. this was really a, a great, uh, a great use of uh, the Zoom and uh, my time. I've, I've gone on a couple of these uh, things through the Digital Cinema Society, and and uh, this is the first one where I'm. Uh, this was very good. Thank you for doing. Thank you, Eric. Appreciate your comments and your time. Also, um, when people come in for demos on the Zoom, usually for cinema, you're not gonna be filming, like you said, an entire project using Zoom unless you're doing documentary style. So the, the real question is, what are you trying to cut it with? If you have a specific set of primes in mind for a project, trying to figure out a Zoom that, that kind of matches that overall look and feel is really important. So bring in your own lenses and then test the Zooms with those. And that's where the coatings come in, the fact that our, our zoom coatings are meant to match with our other lenses is very, very helpful because you can cut a zoom uh, clip 
and throw it in with one of our, you know, one of our prime lenses and it will look uh, relatively similar. Whereas other lenses may stand out and you can't quite tell why, but it would take a while to try to get it to adjust to be exactly the same as the rest of your footage. Now, nowadays we have less issues overall with consistency, even as Steven mentioned, you know, if you're smart about it and plan it out, then of course you can try to be as consistent as possible with your lens choices. But that's sometimes not the case. Sometimes it's just practicality. It's like, well, we have a set of primes for what we want to use, but when we do handheld, we need a zoom because we can't keep changing the focal length. And this is the zoom that we have, and it's not the same manufacturer. Well, nowadays in the digital space, you can address that, right? Like you can make the color correction work and match the, the different lens manufacturers together. That 24 to 290 I mentioned from Ingenue, I mean, at one time that was a lens set with every set. Like if you're doing a TV show in LA, Atlanta, New York, I mean, you, you had the zoom no matter what, you used it a lot and then you matched it with other stuff all the time. That wasn't a problem, it still isn't. So, you know, I've, I've seen uh, like a Fujinon Allura's and a 24 to 290 and a set of Cooks and a couple of Zeiss lenses for specialty shots. It's all right, that's totally cool. Everyone could do it. And that's the beauty of, I think nowadays with the post process is that you now have more control to manipulate that so that you can make things match together. And if you're very clever and you light stuff a certain way, it's all gonna look very similar anyways. And it's really when you get to the editing room floor that you start to see the differences between between the shots more pronounced. But I think we, we have ways to address that. So there's nothing wrong with experimenting and trying it out. But if you're, if you're doing a low budget film and you're not gonna have that time to even go in the color correction because you'll be in another job, then you gotta start thinking about, well, where am I gonna bake in? that's not gonna change and allow me to put my signature on, onto this image. I think that's when the tools like lenses with flares or specialty characteristics or special applications really comes into being very important. And consistency, you know, makes it much easier for you, a lot less, more economical to, to get to the end goal. Cool, so any other questions that we have? No more questions, but I did want to note that I added the registration link to the chat window. Um, if you guys want to join us later, we have a virtual cocktail hour happening at 6 p.m. Pacific time, and it's bring your own beverage. So definitely join us so we can toast the filmmakers of Sundance. Cool.